And I grew up believing there's a God. But most of my life, I believed that he was up there and that I was down here. In fact, I thought if you wanted to talk to God, you had to go to a, a church. You had to kneel a certain way, and I thought you had to talk to him in King James Version. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yea, they, thou, Lord, or something like that. And folks, it's not how you and I talk to him. It's where we're coming from when we, when we talk to him. That's what it's all about. Now, I could stand here this morning, and I could spend a lot of time telling you blood and gut stories of my past. But I'm not here for that. I've been in the brawl room brawls, the gun fights, the knife fights. I got the scars of the good old times I thought I was having before I accepted Jesus as Lord of my life. And that's the difference. The Word of God says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. I did that as a young boy. I heard the message about hell, fire, and damnation. You know, Baptists are good about preaching on that, Pastor Bob. And actually, I think hell ought to be preached because hell is real. It's just as real as heaven. I lived a lot of hell right on earth. Now, I sure don't want to go to that one down there. And I remember Pastor Owen sharing about hell and what it was all about. And it, it scared me. I tuned in that night. I didn't write no notes to the girls. I was up in the balcony. And I figured nobody could see what I was doing, but that preacher, preacher could see everything that was going on. And as he shared that story and gave an invitation, he looked at me in the balcony and he pointed me out and he said, I'm going to tell you something, boy. He said, you better turn or you're going to burn. And as they gave that invitation, I come down them steps as fast as I could, man. I booked in front of that altar, you know. Crocodile tears flowing down my face, scared to death. I did not want to burning in a lake of fire forever. I don't know anybody that wants to do that. I haven't met anybody out on the street that wants to do that. And he said, Barry, if you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and ask him to come in your life, he will. And I did. I did. I prayed what we call a sinner's prayer. Today, you'll have that same opportunity. I was a young boy. But when I walked out of that church building, my life did not change people because I prayed a prayer. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you disciples indeed. He said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The truth. You see, we're all searching for the same thing. We don't want somebody scamming us. We don't want somebody conning us, playing head games with us. We done been down that road. In fact, we've done it. So we know how that's all about. We're searching for something that only God can give us. There's a counterfeit. The name Satan means deceiver. The name devil means destroyer. He's a spirit being. You and I can't see him, just like we can't see God. But he's just as real as God is. And Jesus said he's on a mission. And his mission is to steal, kill, and to destroy all of you and myself and the world. And the reason for that is because you and I have been created in the image and likeness of God. You see this hunk of meat right here? This is not me. You look at your body, that's not really you. The real you is a spirit person who lives inside this hunk of meat we call a body. This body dies. This body will decay. This body will go back to the earth. But you and I, God gave us a will. He gave us a soul to choose where we want to live for eternity. He gave us a soul and a will to choose how we're going to live on this earth for the short time we'll be here. I do not believe that God ordained Barry Mason to be a hell's angel so I could come here and tell you how great God is that he brought me from that lifestyle of death and destruction. And those of you that know anything about it, you know what I'm telling is straight up. You see, I chose that life. God gave me a will to choose. And I chose a pattern of death and destruction 
Not only was I a member, I was an officer, leader. I'm not a big guy. I told it big guns. The last six months I was with them in Charleston, South Carolina, I had 25, 30 pounds of plastic explosives, automatic weapons, hanging aids, all this stuff buried in my backyard. And folks, I believed that what I was doing was right. You see, if we only know one way, if we have no knowledge of another way, then what we really believe in is life. I never read the Bible. When I walked out of that church when I was that young boy, I never opened up the letters from God. I never got to know Jesus, who he is. I just thought, well, I'm saved now, man. When I'm dying, I'm going to heaven. I ain't going to sweat hell. I lied, I cheated. My life did not change because I prayed a prayer. And so I went a whole different direction. My daddy went to prison for murder. There was a big release in our home. My mother remarried, a Christian man. And he tried to teach us what kindness and love was about. And I began to respect this man. I began to look up to my stepdad. He didn't beat us. He didn't hurt us. And when I was 16, he passed away. I became very angry. You know, we become hurt. And then all of a sudden, anger sets in. We don't understand what's going on. At a young age, I didn't understand. And so the first thought that came to my mind was, God took your, your dad. I remember praying, asking that God let him live. But he went on. I didn't understand it. I remember walking out, looking up in the heavens. I shook my fist at God, and I began to curse him. At 16, I walked away, and my life fell apart. I saw a movie, Hell's Angels on Wheels, and that's what did it. And I went full throttle. Prospected, rode with other clubs. Started out with 40 members called Tribulators in Charleston, South Carolina. By the time we, be, we were patched out, red and white, there were six of us left out of 40 men. And we thought we were pretty bad. I found out when I put that death head on my back, it was a lot harder keeping it than it was getting it. I ran bars, gambling, prostitution, you name it, I was involved in it. The city of Charleston was corrupt at the time. The authorities there were corrupt. I was paying the head of the vice squad all, every night a certain amount of money just to let him, just so he'd let me do what I could do. The feds came in, they busted everybody, including the chief of police. See, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be scooter trash to have the enemy, the powers of darkness working in your life. Satan is in every area of society. I remember looking back and I didn't see no preachers coming to me. There were no preachers coming to us when I was riding with the, uh, with the Hells Angels. In fact, it wasn't Christian bikers, Mark. The CMA just got started in 76. I, got, I came to the Lord in 76. There wasn't even Christian bikers. Now there's Christian bikers everywhere, you know? But nobody was handing us any flyers, any tracks, or, or telling us anything about Jesus. And he, even today, Pastor Steve, I still wonder where were the, were the preachers? How come they didn't reach out for us like they're doing today? And I thank God for you men. And I thank God for you women that are doing the work of God and reaching out to people. Because there's got to be a message. There's got to be a, a deliverer of the word. We're in this building here. We're in this huge sanctuary here. And to me, this is R&R, &R, man. This is, this is, you know, this is a place where I can just get free. I look at that motel room I'm staying over there. I said, man, this is a little bit of heaven over here. But you know, I look at everything that's around me and I look at my past and, 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 and you, when you believe in a certain thing, you believe you're doing what's right. And you go with it, with everything you got. I remember a little lady. Can I tell you a few stories real quick? 
There was a little lady, about five foot tall, had solid white hair. Her eyes shined as bright as these lights with the love of Jesus. She had what I call a Holy Ghost grin from ear to ear. Man, she was always walking around saying, praise the Lord, hallelujah, glory to Jesus, you know, a real fanatic about Jesus. She wasn't ashamed of Jesus. And I remember we had a big party one weekend. Hell's Angels came in from New York City. Hell's Angels came in from Cleveland, Ohio, Durham, North Carolina. We had Harleys all lined up Reynolds Avenue on the Strip in Charleston. And this particular bar I had was a private night, uh, nightclub. You couldn't get in unless you had membership. And so we shut it down just for a party for brothers. And I can remember that weekend as we went through, at this time I was snorting crystal meth. Man, I was snorting so much crystal my nose bled, you know. Drinking out of a wild turkey like it was water. We'd get all, get the feeling down after a couple of days and we'd take another snort of that crank and keep on cooking. And all of a sudden, Sunday rolled along. We had the hoochie-goochie girls dancing on the pool tables and the bar, you know, it was, it was pretty wild. Every now and then somebody would take out a, a, a pistol and uh, uh, pop a cap in the ceiling or something, you know. But we were all family, so we didn't, wasn't concerned about it. It just got wild. Sunday morning rolls along, and I'm behind the bar, and I'm serving the drinks to everybody. Everybody's feeling pretty good. Jukebox was going, all of a sudden that door swung open, and in stepped this little lady. She had that Holy Ghost grin on her face. <laughs> that little lady was my mother. You see, my mother loved me. My mother cared. And when she walked through that door, the first word she said was, Praise the Lord, son! Hallelujah! You know? And I mean, every head in that joint turned around to see who it was. Now, most of the guys from Charleston knew my mother because she was always coming down and talking to us about Jesus. My brothers from New York and Cleveland, man, they were freaking out, you know? <laughs> who is this woman? Now, y'all got to understand something here. My mother, when she was talking to us, she was not whispering, okay? And here I was, president of the Hells Angels, Charleston, South Carolina. I thought I was the baddest dude who walked the earth then. I had a beard middle ways to my chest, spiked armbands from my wrist to my elbow, and huge big skull rings, death head rings. These was like weapons. I had hair down the back of my back, and of course, I had more back then on top than I do today, but... When I was jamming down the highway, it looked like a little werewolf. I see some of y'all out there, you know. And I looked back, and I, I can remember my mother when she said that, you know, I, I was, I thought I was the baddest dude who walked the earth. And my mother said, praise the Lord, son. I felt that big, man. I wanted to crawl under the bar. <laughs> I ran over to her, and I said, mother, I said, what are you doing down here? I said, you don't belong down here. She said, well, you don't either, son. Amen. <laughs> she said, I was sitting in church this morning and I was talking to Jesus about you. And I said, I had a problem with that. And the reason I had a problem with that was because I believed God was up there and we were down here. And I thought maybe my mother was hearing voices, you know. And I was very concerned about her health. <laughs> and so I challenged her. I said, Mother, I let me ask you something. I said, when you and God talk, does he come down from heaven and you and him sit around the living room and chit-chat all the time? She says, no, son. She said, the Lord lives inside of me. Now, when she told me that God lived inside of her, I thought she bought the whole funny farm, then. you? know, she lost it all. God living inside of me. And again, you got to understand, she ain't whispering, right? I mean, it was... It, everybody's standing around watching and listening. And then she put her arms around me and hugged me. She said, son, the Lord told me to tell you that you're not a hell's angel. And boy, when she told me that, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. You see, you always got to prove yourself. 
I don't care where you go, who you ride with, there's always somebody that's going to get in your face and say something. And then the enemy comes along and he says, hey, show him. And you got to prove yourself 24-7. And here's my mama telling me, you know, you're not a hell's angel. And, you know, you just don't knock mother out. It don't happen that way, you know? <laughs> so I said, mother, I said, you got to get it in your head. I said, you see that? It says hell's angel, South Carolina. AFFA, -F angel forever, forever an angel. I said, you got to get it in your head. I'm a hell's angel. She said, no, you ain't, son. She said, when you was a young boy, you went to an altar and you asked Jesus to come in your life. She said, your name is written in Jesus' book of life. She said, you're no angel from hell. You're a child of the most high God. And you see, my mother, what my mother was doing, she was trying to take me to my roots. You see, we're all searching for the same thing. People, listen. We're all searching for love. We desire to be loved. We're searching for peace. We desire peace within us. We're searching for joy and happiness. We're, we're searching for identity. Who am I? What's my purpose in this life, in this world? And so the enemy comes and Satan tells us, well, this is what's happening over here. If it feels good, do it. Gusto, you got one life to live. Live it up. And so we go full throttle down a dead end road. Because at the end of that road is death, destruction. The deceiver leads us to a place to even bring death and destruction on other people's lives. I've held people in my arms. I've watched life leave them and death enter. And it ain't Hollywood movie stuff. It's real. My mother could have come in that nightclub. She could have looked at all of us and said, you're all going to hell because you're doing this and doing that. But you see, that wasn't what, what Jesus would do. She'd have been right. But that's not what Jesus would have done. In fact, he went into the, the den of thieves. It was probably a, a honky-tonk, hardcore nightclub and sat amongst he didn't participate but he reached out and that's what God did for me through my mother you see I, I knew my mother I knew she was real I used to think Christians were a bunch of phonies hypocrites wimps sissies you couldn't get me into a church. My mother tried and tried and tried. She'd invite me. I said, I don't want nothing to do with your religious friends. Religious friends. And I still don't want nothing to do with religious people. Amen. I remember one evening, my, my wife, which used to be my old lady. And she was here right now. She'd tell you right up front. She ain't the old lady. She's my wife. And uh, her street name was Gypsy. She was a prostitute. She was a hooker. She worked in the nightclubs as a dancer. And uh, she was just as messed up as I was. And one night we took took off from the nightclub business and went home and you know I, I like to smoke the reefer a little bit because I could relax but I couldn't do it around the people I get paranoid anybody here know what I'm talking about don't raise hands just uh... You know, I snort that old crane, drink that old wild turkey, and I get crazy. But when I started smoking the reefer, man, I get, I get paranoid thinking somebody's going to do something to me, you know? So I could only do it in my house because my house was a fortress. I had semi-automatic weapons behind every door. My windows were covered with chicken wire. You see, I wasn't big, bad, and tough. Deep inside, folks, I was a man that was scared. Scared of death. 
And I thought all those weapons was my power, my defense. And so Gypsy and I used to call me Barry Barry. We went home and we, we were in the house and I pulled out a half ounce of reefer and we began to roll a few joints and we was passing the joint back and forth and watching the tube relaxing. You know, she had all the munchies out and we were sipping on the suds and, and just kind of watching it relaxing. I had chains on the door because I was paranoid about the cops coming, kicking the doors in. Had death heads, skulls all over the house, demonic posters. And all of a sudden a car pulled up and I got paranoid. And the first thing that went through my mind was cops. I said, Gypsy, I said, see who that is, quick. And she kind of two-stepped over toward the window, you know, and she peeked out the window. She said, Barry, Barry. And I said, who is it? You know, I'm thinking cops, right? She said, it's your mother, you know? <laughs> I said, quick, hide everything, man. I'm, I'm running all over the place, spraying the house down, you know, so she couldn't smell the reefer, you know? She didn't know what it was, much less the smell of it, you know? 33 years old, president of the Hells Angels, Charleston, South Carolina, scared to death of his mama, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Glory. And actually, I wasn't afraid of her. I respected her. And that's the difference. And so I told Gypsy, I said, sit down, don't say a word. She'll never know you messed up. Now, you got to visualize this. I was just as stoned as she was, all right? And we're sitting there trying to be cool, right? I unlocked the chains on the doors, and I had a younger sister that was going to a Bible college in Pensacola, Florida, man. She had the whole Bible college talking to Jesus about us, you know? And I'm going to tell you something. When you get a whole bunch of people talking to Jesus about you, you can hang it up, Jack. Something's going to happen to you. Something's going to happen. So Gypsy and I were sitting there, and my mother knocks on the door, and I said, come on in, mother. Door swung open, she had that Holy Ghost grin on her face, you know. She stepped in there and saw all them demonic posters and weapons and stuff, and all of a sudden, the grin left. And when she stepped in my living room, she said, devil, in the name of Jesus, I bind your powers up in Jesus' name. You ain't got nothing in this place in the name of Jesus. And she started doing what we call the Jericho March around the living room, you know. And here's me and Gypsy sitting there. We're tripping out on this reefer, right? <laughs> and Mother's talking to the devil. I said, wait a minute, Mother. I said, this is my house. You don't come in my house preaching like that. She said, I ain't preaching, son. She said, I'm at war. She said, I'm taking the authority Jesus Christ has given me over the prince of darkness in this place. <laughs> Glory. You see, my mama knew Jesus. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. If you're a Christian in here today, and you don't know this, you better grab a hold to it. Because if you're a Christian, God wants you to know you're the most powerful being walking on the face of this planet Earth today. <laughs> Greater is the Spirit of God who dwells in you than the spirit of this antichrist who's out there. Boy, I tell you, I wish I had more time. <laughs> now we got. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you the most exciting thing that ever took place in my life. God moved in my life that day. Oh, I didn't want to show it. You see, we got that old macho stuff, guys. You know, to show a, a, a tear was a sign of weakness. And I remember standing there and my mama, she gave me this book entitled 666. And I wasn't much into reading. And she told me it was about the last days on earth, what it was going to be like. And she said, I want you to read this book. And I, you know, I was willing to do anything just to get rid of her. 
I said, okay. And so her and my sister left, and I opened it up, and I was about still half stoned, and I was reading some of it about the mark of the beast and how you had to bow down and worship the system. And that if you didn't take this mark of the beast, that you would, uh, you can't buy, sell, or do anything on earth in the last days. And you know, we're coming to that. You know that, don't you? We're coming to that place. It's already there. We are in the last days. It's all here. You see, I never knew the truth until I opened up the letters from God. And then all of a sudden, you know, I throw it in the garbage. I said, man, I can't handle this. One time I went over to my mother's house. I just needed some rest. The neighborhood kids, they, they liked me. But the, mo the mothers and fathers of these neighborhood kids didn't appreciate me much. They were always telling my mother, you know, uh, we wish your son wouldn't come around the neighborhood. He's, uh, he's not right for our, our kids, and we, we just don't want him around. And I'm thankful that my mother never told me that I couldn't come around. She always left the door open for me to come any time. And that particular day, I went over to my mother's house. I had a 49 pan head at the time. It was raked and chopped. And uh, back then, we were into the, 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 the speed. And uh, we were called scooter trash. And when you pulled over to the motel room, they uh, put the no vacancy signs on, you know. Now they open the doors for you. Come on in. Got a Harley? You got money. <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> But it wasn't like that in the 60s and 70s. And uh, I remember coming over to my mother's house that day. I just wanted to get away from everything. And I knew there was peace there. And I could spend a day or two there and not have to worry about somebody trying to do me in. And uh, the kids, you know, when they heard me coming on that panhead, boy, I'd be heading down the straightaway to my mother's big, sharp curve. And as I took the curve to the house, these kids would jump out of the, behind the trees in the corner of their houses with their little toy guns, and they'd be going bang, 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 and shooting at me, right? Well, I'd play with the kids, so I'd pull my 357 Magnum out. <laughs> now, I didn't shoot at them, all right? <laughs> but, I, you know, I'd go mm, bang, 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 you know, back, you know, just playing with them, back at them. And, they're, you know, they were loving it. Now, their parents, they were freaking out, you know? They, <laughs> And I can understand that today. <laughs> well, I was just having fun, you know? And I uh, pulled up my mother's uh, front steps. And, you know, you, uh, I've been told this, and I know you've heard it before. You can always tell a happy biker by counting how many bugs he's got on his teeth, you know? <laughs> and so, I, you know, I'd check out my teeth and make sure I look pretty neat before I go to see mother and brush all the kinks out of my hair and beard. And, uh, she always said, you're welcome, son. Just please don't wear that jacket in with, with the death hit. And so I respected that. And I'd take my colors off and I'd lay them across the bike. And I didn't have to knock on the door. I just walked in. I walked in the door, you know, and Mother was standing there with that grin on her face. And when I walked in, the first thing she said then was, praise the Lord, here comes Moses, you know. <laughs> and I thought, oh, no, here we go. She's going to start preaching again. And she put her arms around me and hugged me. And I wanted to hug her back, but I was afraid I'd put little holes in her from them spiked armbands, so I kind of nudged her. And I said, Mother, don't preach to me now. I just need some rest. Can I stay here a day or two? And she said, Sure, son, come on in. You hungry? I said, Oh, yeah. I, mean, I could always eat some of my mom's chow, you know. So she laid a big spread out there for me. I'd be sitting there pigging out. And while I was pigging out, she'd be going in the living room and plugging in these little cassette tapes. Teen challenge about all these drug addicts and prostitutes, how they got turned on to Jesus, you know, and I'll be sitting there and listening to that. And eventually after I ate, you know, I said, I gotta go. I can't I can't handle this. So I got up and started to leave. My mother put her arms around me and said, Son, I want you to know that the Lord told me to tell you it's gonna be like Moses. And I said, What do you mean, mother? I saw that flick the Ten Commandments, you know how the sea opened up and it gave me chills, you know, and I thought, man, that's powerful. And I said, I thought she was making fun of my beard. And she said, well, the Lord showed me 
that she's going to go into places and help lead people from bondage to the promised land, as Moses did. And then she said, you'll suffer much like the Apostle Paul for the kingdom of God. And I didn't understand what she was talking about. But, you know, what my mother did, she spoke things over me. She believed the word of God, folks. She stood on God's word and promises. And she fought for my soul. She fought for me. And I look back on all that, and I thank God today. I remember leaving and I was in, invited actually it was a mandatory deal at an officers meeting in California and so I flew to California and at this officers meeting uh, where we take care of business I was given a list of names to take care of most of them rival club members which at that time I had no problem with. And as I looked down the list, I saw two of my own brothers on that list from my chapter. And I questioned it. And I said, what is this all about? And they said, just do it. And so I refused to do it. And when I refused to do it, my own brothers tried to take me out and put me six foot under. You know, the only life I knew was the outlaw life. My only life then was Hell's Angels. I didn't know any other way. I didn't understand what was going on, but I knew deep inside that this wasn't right. I believe my mother was planting seed during my life. I know that the Spirit of God was still with me as a child, but my mind was so messed up because of the drugs and alcohol I couldn't hear. I didn't know who I was. You know, many of us fall into that trap. We get so wrapped up into ourselves, wrapped up into the world, wrapped up into the drugs and the alcohol. And we hear this voice that says, this is what life's all about and it's all a lie. It's all a lie. Because I got nothing in my past but death, destruction, and a whole lot of hurts. By God's grace, I escaped. I hid out in a little $6 motel room and I called the only person I knew I could trust because I feared for my wife and our little six-month-old baby girl. You see, I grew up without a daddy and I didn't want my, my little girl growing up without one. And I had that pondering in my mind and in my heart all the time, wondering how she was gonna grow up. Is her daddy gonna be underground? Or is her daddy going to be behind the prison walls for the rest of his life? How would this little girl grow up? And I had this war going on inside of me. And so when I left the HAs, I, I called my mother. And I said, Mother, I want you to go down to the nightclub. I want you to get Gypsy. I want you to get little Barry in. I want you to go hide him someplace. She said, what's wrong, son? I said, well, I'll just quit the Hell's Angels. She said, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus, you know. <laughs> I said, Mother, you don't understand what's coming down here. I said, their lives are in danger. And I said, so was mine. She said, son, you ain't got nothing to worry about. You're in the hands of an almighty God. <laughs> my mother was hid my wife and daughter out at a preacher's house in Lassen, South Carolina, and then my mother wired some money so I could get home, Western Union. As I went to get the money, my old brothers had every place covered. They began to close in on me. And of course, the first thing the enemy told me, Satan, was just a matter of time, it's all over. Just a matter of time, it's all over. And you know, they used to tell my mother that too. My mother, she'd be going around and she'd be asking everybody, please pray for my son and his, his wife, Gypsy. There, you know, I, I didn't think anybody in Charleston knew what I was doing. I, I thought I had everything covered, you know, all the bases. My mom was going around telling everybody, he's doing this, he's doing that, he's doing this and that, you know. 
pray for him. And they would tell my mother, you know, there's no hope for your son. He's too far gone. And my mother would look him dead in the face and say, you know something? Jesus ain't returned. Jesus ain't returned. And as long as Jesus ain't returned, there's got to be hope for him. And October 27th, 1976, in fact, when I dated out of the Hells Angels, I dated in the kingdom of God. I got born again, 10, 27, 76. Thank you, Jesus. In a restaurant in California, standing in that restaurant, actually I was saying goodbye because I didn't think I'd ever see my family again. There was five or six of my brothers standing around the restaurant, incognito, no colors. And I just felt like it was just a matter of time and it'd be over. So I called my mother's house, my wife was there, and I began to ask her to forgive me for the things I'd done to her and made her do. She began to cry, I began to cry. You know, when you face something for eternity like that, you don't care who's looking at you. You don't care what's going on around you. You're reaching out. You're reaching and reaching and reaching. And I was standing there reaching. And my mama said, son, she got on these dishes. She said, I want you to know there's hope for you. I said, what do you mean, mother? What kind of hope is there for me? She said, your only hope now is in Jesus. And if you ask him to help you, he will. And the saddest thing in my life, people, was at the age of 33, I did not know how to ask. I didn't know how to pray. And I said, Mother, I don't know how to. And she said, I do. And if you pray this prayer with me, Jesus will hear you. And I believe all the powers of darkness attacked me that day to try to keep me from calling on Jesus. But October 27, 1976, I won the biggest battle of my life. And I asked Jesus Christ as I prayed with my mother, she led me in prayer. I asked Jesus to forgive me. And I can't stand here and I can't say I heard bells ringing and saw rockets taking off when it happened. But I can honestly tell you that I felt something I hadn't felt since I was 16 years old. I felt peace right here between me and God. I made a deal with God that day. I said, God, if you get me out of this mess, I promise you, this time I'll get to know you. And this time I'll do whatever you say do. And God got me out of that mess. I could go on and on and tell stories. But I want to share this with you as my time's running out here. Jesus talked to a man by the name of Nicodemus. He was a religious man in John chapter 3. This elderly religious man approached Jesus one night because he didn't want nobody to see him. You see, a lot of times we don't want nobody to see us around Christians. If we're in the world. And so all of a sudden, this man approaches Jesus and he says, Rabbi, Master, teacher, tell me something. I know you of God. What must I do to enter heaven? And Jesus replied to him, he said, Truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, I'm an old man. He said, I, how, how, do you, how do you do this? How do you be born again? How do you, you don't go back into your mama's womb and be born again. And Jesus replied again. He says, truly, truly, this is the truth. I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit of God is spirit. So we must be born inside of the spirit person, the real you, the real me. 
And the only way that can be done is to receive the one who gives the life, the Savior. When we call on Jesus and we accept him into our life, his spirit comes in. And you, the spirit person who lives inside this hunk of meat we call a body, and the spirit of God comes together and you're born again. You become one. And your spirit desires to do the things of God because we came from God. But our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions, our thoughts are all programmed like a computer to the world and to the world system. And so what God does, he brings life to us through these letters that he wrote to us. But the enemy wants to keep you and I out of these letters. Keep us away from the knowledge of the truth and what real life is all about. And he did it with me. Jesus said, the Spirit of God is like the wind. It comes you know not where. It goes you know not where. But you can show or tell he's been through there. Also, Jesus said in John 3, I'm closing, Pastor. In verse 17, we all know 16. We all know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Amen? Amen. That whosoever believes him shall never perish, but have everlasting life. But let's go to 17. Let's find out why. Quickly. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. You see, we're already condemned, folks. By the powers of darkness and our life and our sin and the things we've done and been born into. But God did not come here to condemn this world, but that the world through him might be saved. In John 24, the, uh, the 24th verse, chapter 5, Jesus, this is all red print. Very, very important. It's God speaking. He said, truly, truly, I say unto you, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation be condemned any longer, but is passed from death unto life. I used to be afraid of death. That's why I carried the guns. That's why I drank the whiskey, snored the crank, to try to cover up the fear. Didn't want to show no fear. Had to be bad and tough. Today, I don't need that stuff because I don't fear death no longer, folks. Christians don't die. We graduate. Amen. We graduate. We go home. I used to jump up on bars and pool tables. I used to pop caps in the ceiling to scare people in the B.C. days before Christ came in my life. And I'd yell out, I'm a hell's angel. If you don't like it, do something about it. And I believed that what I was doing was right. I thought Christians were sissies and wimps, weak. But I stand before you today. And I tell you, I'm ashamed of my past. There's nothing there. Those of you that are living that life, you know what I'm talking about. There ain't nothing there. And I can honestly stand here today and tell you that I'm proud to say that I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. 
and I guarantee you I ain't no sissy. <laughs> and neither is Jesus. And Jesus ain't hanging on a cross someplace, and he's not hanging, he's not in some hole or grave. He's alive and he's real. And the reason I know it is because he changed my heart. He changed my way of thinking. And the Spirit of God brought life into me through his word. And he'll do the same for you. This is not a program, folks. This ain't a lecture. This ain't a sermon. This is a word from God from his heart to you. And he's been trying to get our attention for years and saying, I love you. I love you. I care about you. I didn't come to condemn you. I've come to give you life. I've come to save you. But the enemy has kept us bound. He's kept us wrapped up into the world, wrapped up into us, this lifestyle that we could never hear it. So he would send messengers. God has sent you messengers before. And God is speaking to you today. And you feel something going on inside of you, right in here, tugging on you. And that's the voice of Jesus. There's two voices in this world, my friends. The voice of the prince of death and darkness. And the voice of the prince of peace and life, Jesus. The enemy will deal with your mind. He'll deal with your head. And God speaks to the heart. To the heart. If you listen to your head, if you listen to your mind, and you reject life and the Son of God today and leave this building, you have chosen to live in death. And that is not God's will for anyone. It's your choice. He made his up on the cross for you and I. Gave his life that you might have it. I believe that and I know it. Jesus said finally in verse 25, truly, truly, the truth. I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is the time where the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. You see, we're all dead walking around, just a hunk of bodies, a hunk of meat, thinking we got it all together. And life doesn't begin, really, until we ask Jesus to forgive us and ask him to come into our life, and his spirit comes in. And that's where life begins. I made a deal with the Lord 25 years ago. I said, if you get me out of this mess, I promise you I'll do what you want me to do. All I ask is I live long enough to see my children out on their own. You know what? God has honored that for me, and I thank him daily. I just believe God's word. Amen. I know one thing, I'm living a better life than I ever lived in my whole life. I've had guns put to my head. It ain't been easy. Attempts on my life. Threats. But see, I've also learned that not only am I serving a loving and my powerful God, but he's a mighty, mighty protector. The last two men that were sent to kill me, both of them got saved. And that's awesome. See, there's a plan and a purpose for everybody, everything. And God desires for us to be focused. There's a lot of things that we don't understand. I've questioned God and hadn't got answers, but I know eventually I will receive them. But I do know this much. 
that he's real. And if you feel something happening here today, he's speaking to you. And he's saying, it's time today. This is your hour. This is your time for your salvation for your deliverance from death to life. Choose this day. Who will you serve? It's your choice.